Hey, Grant Davis here with GDI Insurance up in the corner. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar. I have actually closed everyone else's window because it's just kind of a lot of white noise. And so when you attend this webinar, um, you, you will just see me hopefully. And you'll be able to read along with me. Now, what I'm gonna do, this is what I covered real quickly. And um, I, I covered it just to kind of give you an overview. I'm, I've just been doing this for such a long time, over 40 years. I've been doing construction insurance and risk mitigation. Most of the time, mitigating the risk in construction, if you're building something, um, there's only three things you really want, right? You want it done on time, you want it done within budget and without defect. If these three things are accomplished, the purpose for which you want your building built is then accomplished, it's, it's there. So it's uh, like the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come kind of things. The, the one thing we can't ensure is the entrepreneurial risk. Will you be able to sell or rent your building, right? But that should be it. There shouldn't be all this minutia that you see. Um, I, a couple of years back, I saw a hospital down the road from me about 50 miles, 100 miles maybe. I don't know how far down south it was from Turlock, so Central Valley. And I pass this hospital and I see this, this about five story building wrapped in, in like cellophane, it's, deep, it's harder plastic than that. And I find out that what happened is during the course of construction that the uh, subcontractor poured concrete and the concrete began to delaminate. Um, delaminate meaning that it started to just crumble and fall apart inside the structure. So they had to stop building and that thing sat there for a couple of years. I actually talked to the hospital administrator and um, they were suing and all this other stuff was going on. And I'm going to tell you that that was a mistake. I, I'm just going to tell you it was a mistake. The triggers weren't put in place. The pools of money weren't there. So as you, as you consider the way I speak, what I talk about, what I'm going to share with you, um, at the end of this, there'll be an opportunity for you to click a little button, um, or I'm guess down sideways or maybe right in the middle of it, wherever the marketing people put it, you know how that goes. But anyway, I, I don't work with a lot of clients, um, especially new clients. It, it takes a lot of time. So if you'd like to see, if you'd like to work directly with me, I, I do respond though. So I will give you a call and I'll talk to you, but if you'll fill out this little form, It'll come directly to me. I'll take a peek at it. And if I could help you, I will give you a call. If I can't help you, I will give you a call and point you in the right direction. So, so you can't lose by asking for my help. There'll be a few of you that I will actually work directly with. I work on, um, I work on small projects too. I don't wanna say I work on only large projects, but most of the time, um, this is what I do. So insurance quoting, you know, getting you premiums and pricing. Um, you know, we have good people that do that. I, I don't do that myself. I don't even probably know how to quote anymore. Now, when I started 40 years ago, I used to quote everything by hand. I used to then you got the computers and I did all of that. And I spent all my time quoting insurance. And really and truly, if you just want a quote, might as well stop the video right here, you know, stop, just exit the webinar and, and no sense going any further because I'm not going to give you a quote. I, and nobody, and I, I make the statement, nobody needs another quote. Now, that, that doesn't mean that if you become our client that we're not going to get quotes. We, we represent a ton. I don't even know. I lost track over 100 something. I lost track. I don't know how many companies we represent and have access to doesn't even matter. I just know we have the right ones. We have the big boys and we could do the big steps and then we do the small stuff. So whatever you have, we can probably help you with. Now, whether it's me that helps you or somebody else will depend on the complexity of your risk. As an example, just, just as an example, at this very moment, I have in Hollywood, there's a house on a hill with three foundations built in correctly. And in Los Angeles, there's an actor that also has a house on a hill 
that built in correctly. And I'm consulting with both of their attorneys on just what I'm sharing with you here. As you look at my screen, this is the hold harmless sample. And um, I recommend you have your attorney review it. And um, if you're working with me, I will, I will give a copy of this in Word to you and your attorney. And I will consult with your attorney at no, because once you're my client, I don't, I don't charge for that. I, at times I have to charge fees and such, but we're all big boys and girls and we'll just put our big boy and girl pants and we'll talk about what we need to, for me to go forward. If, if there's not, it just, it just kind of depends. You know, everybody has to make a living. So um, it just kind of depends on what you've got going on and what you need. Now, these two that I'm talking about, um, they don't really need insurance. And, I, and insurance to me is garbage. I don't really care about insurance at all. Um, I, I, it's a backstop. It's not where the, the game's on the field. Here's here, what I'm sharing with you is the game. Let's not need insurance. That's, that's the goal is not to need insurance. If you need insurance, something went wrong, right? So now then if you do need insurance in your project because a subcontractor or a general contractor or something went terribly wrong in your project, my objective is to make sure that, okay, now we need the insurance and I call it a pool of money. There's a pool of money over here we, we need access to. How do we gain access to it quickly and efficiently? That's because if you've got a project, you know you want it done, right? On time, within budget, without defect, quickly and efficiently is the key. So the key that unlocks the insurance vault, if you would, or that pool of money that they have is a proper, it starts with proper risk transfer. It really does. Um, I, I keep, you know, if you notice, I have a lot of videos on this. This is the most important thing for anyone to know. And by the way, it's the one thing, and you just watch it. You, you know, if you're a contractor, a bit of city job or a municipality, name us as an additional insured. Really? But, I mean, I have a whole book. It's, it's right here, the whole book. I, I can't, I'm going to show it to you. I got to pull this out of here without breaking everything because I don't, I haven't, I'm a dyslexic guy, so I have it in your memorized. But look, there's a whole book on the additional insured, but this is a book. This is a book. What additional insured form do you need? And why do you need it? The city, you know, oh, name us as an additional insured. Okay. You know what I'm gonna do? If you're my client and someone says that, I'm gonna give them the weakest additional insured form I can find because I represent you. Now, if I represent you and you're asking for the additional insured forms, we're gonna use this form right here. Let's, let's just get to it. So prior to commencement of any work, key, any work at all. So, so here's the deal you've got, here's what they're gonna do, right? You wanna make this part of the contract that they sign because here's the deal. If this is part of the contract, this is also then part of the work that they've agreed to do. People miss that, okay? So, okay, prior to starting, Put your company name, and I'm GW, GW Davis. So it's just, you know, GDI insurance. I just use GW just because I'm getting older and I like it. <laughs> I've been doing this 40 years, long time, so I can play a little bit. Anyway, any and all contractors and service providers must follow in their contracts or agreements and add this to them. They must be in there. So everybody has to have this in their contracts and agreements. It's required by written contract. Okay, so, so here's the deal. Why do we say that cleanly and plainly? Because every additional insured form, everyone, even the ones that say they're blanket or some other BS that they got going on, it has one, the very first and very most important requirement is that it's required by a written contract. If it's not required by a written contract, the additional insured form does not attach. So what you think you get, you just don't get. This is why this is a webinar. See, and we're going a little deeper into this. Sorry, I've got these new glasses. They just keep falling down my face. So that's why I'm pushing them up. So sorry, I'm going to go back and get new glasses. I, you know, I'm not going to play with this much longer. So anyway, um, now this was for a Utah company here, but it could be, it, you change it to whatever state. So any of any tier, by the way, so this includes subcontractors. So you hire a general contractor, the general contractor agrees that all the subcontractors will also do everything this is doing. And guess what happens? 
if the general contractor then doesn't do their job and doesn't get this from every subcontractor, this is where this is the beauty of all this is going down to this indemnity and hold harmless agreement that they're gonna sign right here, see this? So, so what do you think happens when they've agreed, when they've agreed that every service provider, every subcontractor service provider of any tier, and then we're gonna put in, like if it's Utah, we're gonna put in the statute um, like I did. If it's California, I'll put in the statute. We'll get the statute that requires this and we're gonna put this in, right? So if they don't do it, what happens? They're personally responsible for it. So they're they're laying, I'm sorry, I pick on, I've been doing this 40 years. I'm sorry, they're, you know, well, there's about 1% of us that insurance brokers, that are this deep into this. The rest of them dabble in construction insurance. I don't dabble in it. The, the, this is what I do. And by the way, the same thing that I do here, I do it for other businesses. I have a snake breeder I'm doing it for right now. I have a, a person with a strip mall, same thing. I have a, a potential client with 436 apartments over six states. Guess what? They don't have this. I have an HOA in Utah, one of the, the premier jewel actually. Um, they didn't have this, they have it now, but they didn't have it. This is, this is why this one says Utah. I took their names and stuff out of it, but this is why this one says Utah. This is the one for them. I just pulled it up and just said, okay, this is it, okay? Anyway, and then here's the thing, by written contract, we require workers comp, okay? Um, in the applicable laws, employer's liability at least $1 million includes sole proprietorships. <laughs> yeah. So you hire a person that says, oh, I don't need workers comp because it's my son and I, we're family members, we're exempt. Wow. Don't let them touch your project. Sorry, buddy. I, I know. I know what I just said. And I know how hard this is. But here's the thing. If this person gets injured and has no workers compensation because they're exempt, um, guess what? Have you ever seen someone drowning and you know that they pull everybody down around them? They can't help it. They're trying to just save their life, right? This person falls off a ladder, breaks their neck, they're paralyzed from their neck down. I'm sorry. And by the way, I'm, when I'm sharing things like this, this has happened. These are, these are claims. I've been doing this 40 years. Paralyzed from the neck down, absolutely happened. Fourth rung of the ladder, fell paralyzed from the neck down, right? Now, what happens if they don't have any workers comp because they're exempt? Who's gonna pay for that? Well, let me ask you, whose property and whose project were they on? They were on yours. Guess what? First party liability claim against you, against you. Now, we're gonna try, if you go to the indemnity clause here, we'll flip it back. It's called action over and third party action over is very important. So the subcontractor's policies need to include action over and third party action over. But the problem with the sole proprietorship is they're the named insured. And so it doesn't apply to that named insured. The named insured is exempt when it comes to action over and third party action over. So again, make them have workers compensation, um, including, and then we're gonna go over here, including a waiver of subrogation in favor of you guys right? Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you have a waiver of subrogation? You, what that means is that if they are hurt on your property as an employee and uh, the workers' comp company pays for it and they say, hey, gee, we want some money back. Guess what? They can't. Subrogation is how an insurance company goes back after whoever they think is responsible. Okay. So we want to include that. Commercial general liability with combined bodily injury property damage of at least $1 million per occurrence, $2 million in the aggregate. That means they could have one claim is a million, the second claim in a year is a million, two million, they're exhausted, they're out of insurance. The aggregate must be applicable on a per project basis. Okay, why do we want that? Well, how many projects have they done in a year? We talk about how to, if you look, there's a video, please watch it on here. How do you choose a contractor? Very important, I'm not gonna cover it again, but for a project basis, that means that that aggregate now isn't 2 million per year, it's 2 million per project. Coverage must include the following perils, broad form blanket contractual liability. Because here's the deal, when you're named as an additional insured, 
that protects you against lawsuits that are brought against you, right? Okay, but it also does another thing for you. It allows you to make a claim directly with the insurance company and that insurance company needs to respond to you. So right now, one of the um, people that I'm consulting with right now, with, with his permission, by the way, he's in there. He gave me a video testimonial, Adam, he, he did that. And he said it was okay to share his deal. Here's the deal. The contract that he signed three years ago before I was involved was that, art, I don't know, something you get you know, offline from the architects or engineers, or I don't know where they find this stupid form. It's the worst contract I've ever seen in my life and did nothing for them at all. Um, but that being said, um, blanket contractual liability comes from the additional insured. Contractual liability. We've, we've named as an additional insured and guess what? Well, we know that the insurance comes off. I'll go into construction defect litigation in another video, um, you know, that's a whole note. I could talk for hours on that. Okay. We also need to include products completed operations. What that means is that if I, if I put in, a, if I'm a plumber and I put in a pipe and I don't quite sweat it in right. And I leave the job and a year and a half later, my joint comes undone and it just, you know, I didn't do a good job and it floods the whole house. I'm responsible as the plumber still, I got to repair my damaged item, the piece of pipe, but all the damage caused by that is what's called products completed operations, okay? Um, broad form property damage has to be in there too. Um, it's, it, it's just an extension of coverage, but it it's just should be part of the deal. I mean, it just gotta be in there. Personal and advertising injury, um, libel, slander, things like that. Independent contractors coverage form has to be included. Um, I'll get into this. So, so the key here is that in, in most insurance policies, if a general contractor hires a subcontractor to do something, let's pick on the foundation and they woof it, they put it in the wrong place, they do something like that and the owner then now becomes responsible. It causes consequential damages. Big word, consequential damages. Can't even hardly say at this point. Anyway, and causes that. Um, it's it's a it's a kind of a big deal, right? So there's a endorsement in there that says, "Hey, we don't cover um, just making a mistake. We cover products completed operations, unless." And I'll tell you the unless later, because there's a way to get this covered. Um, depend, if you're a general contractor, this is important. If you're an owner, this is important. And this is why we go back here. Every subcontractor does the same thing. If it's done properly, there's no, there's no chance of, of having a problem. You have this, and then you have, uh, you know, I didn't get into the bond. I'm just going into this part, but bonding, performance and payment bonds, very important. And I'm going to take a second. Performance and payment bonds are very important, even if you don't actually get one but you need to see that they qualify for one because if you've got a contractor that can't qualify for a performance and payment bond, can't get one, um, do you really want them working for you? Same thing when, when you go into my video on how to hire a contractor, loss history. No, ever, oh yeah, I'm gonna hire this contractor. Good bid, looks like a good guy. Everything's great, good guy or girl, I'm sorry. And um, well, did you look at the last five years of their projects and did you see their losses, get a loss run? and see what losses they have. Are they doing a good job? How do you know? Because you feel good, if you feel good. This is what I tell people too. Everything's, everything's based on feelings. It's supported by facts. Unfortunately in construction, even with cities and municipalities, big, big projects, you know, they do the same thing. They, they, they woof it. They don't ask for loss runs. How do you know they're gonna do a good job? I'm just gonna tell you this, is if you got somebody that's, that's um, yeah, I got this stupid light not working. Okay. Anyway, if you got somebody that that is um, doing a project, right? And um, how do you know that they're going to do a good job for you? Based on the last five years, good projection of the next five. Anyway, um, I'll keep moving. Endorsements shall be furnished in reflecting the inclusion of the interest of the owners, instruction, I mean, everybody basically. Now we're gonna come down to this. This is very important and it's amazing to me. I'm gonna highlight it. It's just amazing to me. Oh, name me as an additional insured. 
Okay. Now this is very specific. These are these are not for you, by the way. Using the CG, you know, 2010-1185 or the combination of the 2010-413 with the 2037-413. See, look at there's there's um, there's an additional insured form <laughs> number, and I have to have a book. I've been doing this 40 years. I, I'm just, you know, I've got it online too, but I just got the book. I just, you know, I've got it all tagged and, and highlighted because, you know, when you, you bring your project to me, I know the answer, but you know what I do? I double check. I say, okay, here's the form numbers. And, but before I would tell you that, I would check to make sure it's proper for what you're doing. Makes sense, right? Um, so again, we're going to come back to this. Do you really need a quote? So if I can get you the exact same policy you have right now, everything you got, and add the things that I'm talking about to it and fix it. And then, and then every time you do a project, we're doing this work for you and making sure you get it right. And, and then when things change, the laws change, we, we say, hey, you need to update and change this and that. Um, I'm just gonna tell you it's safer. Who should be your broker? Someone that dabbles in this? Oh, I've got 10, 20 contractors or someone that has hundreds of contractors over 40 years. I don't even know how many I have. I'd have to run a list, you know, but it's because of this. I don't believe I have one client that actually cares, that works directly with me, that actually cares what they pay. I mean, they care. Look, I mean, we all care. It's like, you know, I, I just, I bought a Tesla, right? I, I care what I paid for it. <laughs> you know, I care, but it's value. Okay, so I, oh, here's what it costs, it's going to cost. Here's what I'm saving in gas. It's value. Same thing here, right? Value. Coverage should reflect the insurance be primary and non-contributory with respect to. Now, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up here. You did get that being named as an additional insured means nothing unless you get the proper form numbers in here. Proper form numbers. These are not proper unless you were this client. Different clients need different, may need the same form number, but not maybe the version date has to change. Because the version date changed the form. <laughs> it just did. Okay. Anyway, so primary, um, non-contributory, very important. Um, should be on an occurrence basis with carriers that we agree to. A copy of the endorsements um, and documents required to verify such insurance to be submitted with the appropriate certificates or upon request of your company. Failure to provide these documents is not to be construed as a waiver of the requirements to provide such insurance. Why do we say that? We're loading up this indemnity and hold harmless agreement. All of this flows down to an indemnity and hold harmless agreement, which means that we woof it, we're responsible for it. We make a mistake and your construction, we're responsible. We're responsible for the safety of our people. We're responsible for all of these things. That indemnity agreement down there is going to take care of it. Commercial auto insurance to include hired and non-owned vehicles with a combined blah blah. And oh yeah, I'm an independent contractor. I've got personal auto insurance. Can't be on the job site. Can't can't drive over there. You got to have this right here. Okay, an umbrella. Okay, this is a million dollars. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you a million dollars. I'm working from home. This virus thing. That's my grandmother's grandma clock. My grandmother's grandmother's grandma clock. Sorry, this, this stupid uh, light I got to try to make me a little brighter keeps going off. So yeah, I'm an insurance guy, by the way, not a tech guy. So you, you, you'd you laugh if you looked at how I'm making this video. You, you'd say, oh, my goodness, how, how's this even happening? You know, but anyway, so, uh, you know, five or 10 million is really what you need. And um, depending on the project, I have hundred million dollar limits, you know, on some, you know, and some higher, you know, if you're doing a $568 million build, how much insurance do you need? Don't need a million. I'd say a million dollars is not anything anymore. Okay. Um, so the contractor shall file certificates of insurance with coverage with the proper additional insured forms prior to the commencement of work with the owner and the general contractor, which shall be subject to the owner. General contractor, and you guys approve of the adequacy and protection and satisfactory character of the insurer. The carrying of insurance described shall in no way be interpreted to relieve the contractor or subcontractor of its responsibility and liability under this 
contract, the carrying of the insurance described. Just because they carry it, they're still responsible to indemnify and hold you harmless, whether their insurance does or not. He's saying we're loading, we're loading the deck here, right? Any policies affected by the contractor on its own and or rented equipment and materials shall contain a provision requiring the insurance carriers to waive their rights of subrogation against, sorry, that should be highlighted, um, your name there, right? Your name here, GW, me, I say put your name there and all other indemnities named in the contract. So if they're bringing rented equipment on, guess what? <laughs> yep, we wouldn't waive it. We don't want to pay for it. Should the because because we're not doing the work, right? I'm the owner. I, I hired this out. I, well, what the heck? Why why am I paying for your your forklift or your earth mover? I'm not going to do it. Prior to the commencement of the work, I'm sorry. Prior to the contract being accepted by you, all contractors of all tiers must submit for approval their pri their. I'm sorry, a list of their projects for the last five years and currently data loss runs, general liability, as well as workers comp. Also copy of the contractors, OSHA safety plans must be submitted. Here we go. Now I'm helping you out right here because here's, if they do this, by the way, the safety OSHA will shut you down like that and they should. If someone gets injured and no one, you guys aren't being safe, shut that sucker down. I've seen it happen. My son's an iron worker, Dallas iron worker, union iron worker, projects get shut down and those guys are safe. But you know, a wall falls on somebody, someone loses a hand, a deck, someone cuts something and it drops and you know, they get tore up. Hey, OSHA's out there, man. And they shut that project down. Do you want your project shut down? Okay, make sure that they're OSHA compliant. How do you know? Send it to us. We'll take a peek. It's easy. We can look. Um, five years currently dated loss runs. Again, best, best indication. Are they gonna do a good job for you? What did they do for the last five years? What are their projects and what are their losses? Just saying, these are what you want, okay? No work is permitted to begin until all contractual items are completed and accepted and approved to work status shall be given. And guess what? People are going to ignore this. And so we're going to go down, I mean, contractors, I know, and their agents, by the way, are just brokers are awful because what they want to do is the subcontractor wants to get paid. They'll put some garbage together and they'll, I try, I say, throw one across the plate. They're trying to throw a strike. You not notice that it's missing something. It doesn't, and what they're doing is they're hurting their client. It does not relieve their client of the obligations in here. And in fact, if their insurance then isn't performing the way it would perform, had they done what you required, they're responsible for it personally, their businesses. And guess what? Most contractors, um, these are small businesses, most contractors. The majority are owned by individuals and families, right? That's how they do it. That's how contractors do it. They, they're owned by individuals and families. Well, guess what that means? Individuals and families can't hide behind their corporations. They're, 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 gonna, get, they're gonna get hammered here with this too. Darn light keeps going up. Don't know what to do about this yet. We'll fix that next time. Anyway, sorry about the, the darkness there for a second. Okay, so the indemnity is just really um, very, very simple. And this is where you want your attorney involved also. To the fullest extent permitted by law, all contractors doing work at your name here. I'm sorry, I got to highlight a couple more. Shall indemnify and hold harmless, you guys, its agents, property managers, and employees, and any of them from and against claims against claims, damages, losses, and expenses, including not limited to attorney fees, rising out of as a result of the performance of their work. Okay, so anything that happens to the fullest extent of the law, provided that such claim, damage, loss, or expense is attributed to bodily injury, sickness, disease, or death, or to the injury or destruction of tangible property, but only to the extent caused by the negligent act of mission of the contractor or subcontractor. I'm gonna stop there and not read the whole thing, but I, I wanna do talk, talk about the reason it says this. So a type one indemnity says they're just responsible, period, 100%, doesn't matter what they did. This is a type two indemnity, okay? In California, they got rid of type one indemnities, first in um, commercial work, and then in, now in residential, um, 
I'm sorry, backwards, residential housing, and then now in commercial work, type one indemnities went away. So I had an iron worker local in California, crane operator, they had a type one indemnity, which the crane company did with my iron worker, the, the crane operator bounces it, tears off an iron worker's leg, the iron worker sues the crane operator, the indemnity clause flipped it back to my client, $850,000 loss, no kidding. Um, and it wasn't my client's fault. It was the crane operator's fault. That was a type one indemnity though. That was the only way to get cranes out in those days. Okay. But today in California, it's not even allowed. It's a type two indemnity. You're responsible for what you're responsible for. If you didn't do it, you don't have to pay for it, that's, but that's okay. That's all we really want anyway. Okay. Um, anyway, so, um, the indemnification hold harm, all the employees, this is all just kind of, you know, things that have to be in there, but, but this is the trigger. So if, if you could imagine a gun and a target, the target is just getting your project completed. You have a gun pointed at it. You want to pull the trigger and have it done. Okay, this what this does is this triggers insurance. Now, if you'd like to work directly with me, um, then there's a button down here. I have a second webinar I'm going to do that's going to talk a little bit more about business in general because we provide HR systems. We do provide OSHA compliance. Um, just so you know, we provide, eight, you know, there's also put a link here to YGDI. We, we provide all your OSHA compliance, all your HR materials that you need, because uh, safety and um, HR are employee benefits. We also have full employee benefits staffing, and we do a heck of a lot of group insurance and all handle all of that for you, too. We go into OSHA compliance, which goes into your workers' compensation, and we go into all of these other measures here to transfer risk and get it taken care of. All of this, here's, here's the bottom line. Here's your premium and here's the risk. If we reduce the risk, the premium is gonna drop. In between risk and premium, insurance company profits, we get paid, underwriting, and that's why you end up like this, risk and premium. So think about it, reducing your risk naturally reduces your premium. It just does. So a lot of times we'll get involved. I've, I've had it happen. Oh, I've had it happen. I'm just thinking of one case right now in particular. It was a dairy company. So, um, and they do some construction work with the very same company they were insured with, same company. At re, they gave, we, we, you know, they just wanted to work with us. We did all of this plus more, 27% reduction across the board. Same company, just because of this work, because it reduces the risk. Everyone knows that. So if you'd like, again, if you'd like to work directly with me, fill out the form down here. I promise I'll call you either way and help you out. So whether I'm going to work with you or, or not, I will call you either way and help you out. The light went out again. I just can't take it. Ah, one of these days. Anyway, so this is my personality too, by the way. Um, now that being said, you're having trouble with attorneys. You're having claims. I get involved. I'm, I'm an expert witness and, and qualified as an expert witness on a lot of stuff like everything we just read, contractual transfers, insurance policies. I consult with attorneys. I tell them what it means. I point out where the coverage is and how it attaches to different things. Um, that's what I do. I work both sides of the fence too. I work with the ones that have damage they're going after contractors and I work with contractors and defend them against that. And then I also primarily though, I work with project owners that don't wanna have any problems. They want their project done on time, within budget and without defect. And if any of those things don't happen, I'm the guy that hopefully, hopefully has um, taken care of it. I'm gonna stop recording right now, as you see. And I hope that you'll fill out the button, hit the button below. And I hope to be talking to you personally very soon. Thank you.